Are we one year away from Boston College football being an actual college football playoff contender? No, folks, we're being serious. You are locked on Boston College, your daily podcast on the Boston College Eagles. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and welcome. This is Locked On Boston College. I am your host, AJ Black. This is Locked On BC, your team every day, the only daily Boston College podcast out there. Thank you for joining us. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On College for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. So, on today's episode, we had an idea that we had talked of, I had talked about with Mitch Wolf. And this is an idea that we had talked about and percolated on for two weeks. We wanted to bring it up to you. And the theme of this episode is that Boston College is one year away from being a playoff contender. And we're being dead serious about this. And to talk about it, we have Mitch Wolf on. Mitch, how's it going? It now occurs to me that this would have been a great uh, episode for April Fool's Day, and then we could have been serious about it. And, you know, we could have made a joke out of that. But, uh, you know, we, we saved it until the end of May when the content schedule is drying up. So but yeah, this is an idea. I think I think I brought up to you a few weeks ago and I was like, this this might be a real thing. Yeah, Mitch has Mitch has been dead serious about this, that this is something that's actually a this is not a joke. We're not here to content farm or SEO clickbait, whatever. We're talking about this as an actual realistic possibility. So the, the let's get into this college football playoffs. It's different than what we just saw. Last year, we saw a dominant Florida State team not make the playoffs because of the, um, the, the selection committee and the way things are set up. But now we're getting to a bigger setup where more teams are going to be able to get in. This is going to be more favorable for a team like Boston College Mitch, talk about why, just from a setup point, this could be better for BC. Yeah, so basically under the four-team format, BC, one, had to win the ACC championship, um, two, probably go undefeated, um, and then, you know, then even as we saw with Florida State, you know, you have to have luck on your side with some things. Um, and even, I think you can make the argument that BC was is probably closer to where Cincinnati was when they went undefeated in back-to-back regular seasons. Um, and then they finally made the playoff in 2021. Uh, so like BC, if, if they went undefeated, when the ACC championship, if it wasn't against, you know, a great team, they didn't have a great schedule. <clears throat> if there's, you know, at least two other undefeated teams and then maybe two, you know, other really good power conference teams, then maybe they get left out. So th- that's very plausible. But now under the 12 team format, which is it's a five, uh, well, it says five seven on the website, but it's I guess it's really four. Um, so the first, the highest, the four highest ranked conference champions will be seated one through four, and each of them will receive a first round bye. The next uh, seven teams, se- teams seated five through twelve, will play each other in the first round on the home field of the higher ranked team. And all those seven bids are at larges. So you know you might you're probably gonna, now that there isn't a Pac twelve, you probably won't see a conference champion there. But basically. Um, and I think there is one guaranteed spot for the non-power conferences. So whatever their highest ranked champ or whatever the highest ranked team is. So like, like last year, that would have been, um, I guess SM, no, it would have been Liberty. Um, so yeah. And then, so the rest of the spots, you know, they can go to any team. So that is where BC comes in because at this point in BC as a program, they're probably not contending for the ACC championship on a consistent basis. You know, maybe you have one or two years where things, everything goes right. You have that great year and you contend for it. Now, you know, there, there are a lot more open avenues for teams that are two lost teams, maybe three lost teams in weird years, but that's probably still the cutoff. Um, unless you're a team in the SEC who has a crazy schedule and you lose to like the top three teams in the playoff or whatever. But now again, with this 12 team playoff, there is a world where BC can get into the playoff. And honestly, you know, again, if they have a crazy good year and they do win the ACC championship, well, I guess then that was maybe they would be a higher seed. But if they have a really good year, and maybe they lose in the ACC championship, but they have a really good season, they might even get to host a playoff game, which it, <laughs> the thought of hosting a playoff game in Alumni Stadium around New Year's is something that I'm sure the, the College Football Playoff Committee is not super thrilled about. 
I can imagine the state troopers that are uh, going to be forced onto uh, duty there, and and team ops would not be happy about that one. No, but, I don't think any any stakeholder with actual connections to Chestnut Hill would be <laughs> would be happy at all with that happening. So let's let's look a little bit at Bill O'Brien. He gives you a a different edge to next year, and in, in the term of the program, we've talked about this for the last like three months that. You brought in a coach that knows how to coach, that has experience everywhere, that has one that has connections to Bill Belichick, to Nick Saban. He seems like a guy that would be better suited to win closer games, to get your team ready to to battle and get your team to that next echelon. How would he, Bill O'Brien and his staff, get BC to a to that next level? I think that's the, that's a big factor, especially next year. Once he's really into the program, he has more of his guys on the team. Uh, they're more familiar with the systems. You kind of assume that there probably won't be a ton of coordinating and coaching changes going into 2025. Um, and yeah, like in a lot of these, a lot of the, you know, situations we've talked about with BC over the last few years is, you know, one, I mean, this year they, they got lucky, especially early in the season to one score games uh, in the past. That hasn't necessarily been the case. Um, You've seen like a lot of like questionable coaching decisions in clutch situations. Uh, team necessarily hasn't been prepared for situations like that. And especially down the stretch of the season, we saw BC kind of fall off a cliff every time we got to November. And I think based on everything we've heard about practices and just Bill O'Brien's experience as a head coach, I don't think you're going to see that be the case. I think you're going to see this team be more prepared to go into the later parts of the season, the later parts of games, and continue to contend and be on the plus side of a lot of those uh, you know, marginal differences you need to win games close and win games late in the season. Right. And you look at the way that they're setting this, this team up, they're putting more money into Boston college. They're putting more money into the coaching staff. And I look at the strength and conditioning coach, uh, Craig Fitzgerald. And that's going to be a key too, because I think a lot of folks don't put weight into strength and conditioning but when you see a team like bc consistently falling apart because of injuries later later in the season you understand that there's something going on now you're bringing in a guy that the florida gators wanted and he's coming to bc he's going to get this team in better shape and that you combine the month of november in new england with a coach that can get you to the month of November, hopefully in one piece, that in that in itself is going to get you. You're going to get a better chance at getting at a higher bowl or the playoffs, as you said, Mitch. Yeah, absolutely. And I think something that you've kind of talked about additionally is that, you know, going into next year, we're expecting Bill O'Brien to be more active in the portal, you know, get yep. recruiting a little more kickstarted, but uh, this year, just with the timeline of how he became the coach that, they're a little behind the eight ball, but once they get a season, a season under them, especially one when I think that he's going to kind of surprise some people that there'll be some good momentum behind this program. All right. In a moment, let's start looking at the roster offensive and defensively and the schedule. We Mitch and I have a whole episode on this folks buckle up because we're going to talk about why 2025 could be a playoff season for BC in a bunch of different reasons. We got more to get into all in just a moment. Game time makes NBA final tickets even faster and easier. You're going to head to those Celtics games. You're ready for a national championship and NBA finals here at uh, the TD Garden. You need to get onto game time because prices on the game time app actually go down the closer it gets to tip off with killer last minute deals. All in prices. View from your seat in their lowest price guarantee. Game time takes the guesswork out of buying NBA tickets. It's not just the the not, not just basketball. You want to get to those Celtics games? Go for it. You can get Red Sox tickets. You can get Woo Sox tickets. You can get theater tickets, concert tickets. Kenny Chesney's coming to Boston. You can get his tickets all on Game Time. So make sure you get check that out. Download the Game Time app today. I'm telling you, folks, I use it. You should too. Create an account and use code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L O C K E D O N C O L L E G E 
for $20 off your first purchase on GameTime, the perfect app for getting to your sports, getting to your concerts, getting to your theaters. Download that app today with GameTime. Last-minute tickets, lowest prices, guaranteed. Locked on Boston College. I am your host, AJ Black. And before we get into this next segment, I want to tell you, we have, it's official visit season. If you want official visit news, go back to last, yesterday's episode. I've got news. I've got updates. You need to get into all of that. But if you want the details of what's going on, I have five updates today up on Eagle Insider. And I'm charging right now. It's 60% off. It's the price of a cup of coffee. Just take one day off from Starbucks. Just do it. And sign up for Eagle Insider today. You're going to get my insight. Tomorrow, on Friday, Mitch has an entire preview on the offensive line that's going up. It is detailed. It is something that you're going to want to make sure you get into. And you're only going to get that if you're a VIP subscriber. Get in right now. 60% off. Details are up in the comments of this show. Make sure you do that right now. Now, Mitch, this offense, I think that's what a lot of folks are excited to see. You have an offensive mind like Bill O'Brien coming in with an offensive um, – I don't want to. I don't even know what to call him, but a exciting player in Thomas Castellanos with some really exciting players around him, with Kai Robichaux, Lewis Bond, um, Jerron Bradley. You you know, there's a lot of guys around them that that could make this offense fun. Now, going into next year, 2025, we're talking about the potential, uh, the potential of Boston College making a bowl game. Where does this offense look like, and how could it lead to BC getting to a spot that most people don't think they could do it? So I think the biggest thing, obviously, is Thomas Castellanos. You know, he probably has to take a pretty sizable step forward this year. But I think the other part of it is that if he if he does it, even if it's a you know a a, mar- a smaller step forward, but it's there's definitely progression for him as a passer. You feel really good about him coming back in 2025. And taking another step because that will be the first time that he has been in a system with at the same school for an entire off season. Um, Cause obviously he tra- he's at UCF for as a, as a true freshman, he transfers during the spring of the, after that year he comes to BC. He's not here the whole time next year. There's a whole new offense system for the going into this season. So, you know, you get him basically in a system for two years and you hope that as a senior, then he is, you know, progressing a lot mentally and he's you know uh, one of the better quarterbacks in the conference look at the rest of the offense you're not going to see a ton of attrition there so in terms of the running game you're probably going to lose Kyra you're going to lose Kyra Robichaux and Treshawn Ward who are older players but you're getting uh, Jordan McDonald who transferred in this year who's kind of a bigger back and be your bell cow guy uh, Alex Broom is looks like he's going to miss a lot of this year so he can redshirt this year so you get him back an experienced player who Adds an element of explosiveness to the offense. And then you've got a guy like Daytrell Jones, who's really impressed in the spring, and Turbo Richard is coming in as a freshman. And so you've got four running backs. It's a solid backfield. You know, we have to see how they fit this year, um, see what they can do. But, you know, there's I'm not concerned about that position. Look at the receiving weapons. I'm kind of assuming you're going to get Bradley and Bond back for their final years. Excuse me. Um, and then you've got still you've got a ton of receiving weapons besides him. You've got Jaden Skeet coming back, Jordan, uh, Jaden McGowan, Reed Harris. Um, and you know, obviously the transfer portal is a thing we have to worry about. But um, you know, I, you probably assume like maybe one of the lower receivers on the depth chart might transfer. A guy like Dante Reynolds or Montreal Wade or something. Um, and then you still got Jeremiah Frank coming back for another year. Matt Reagan, who I think is going to have a big year this year or a, a bigger role this year. Um, and so tight end, you know, maybe you kick around and try to find another transfer there next year. And then the offensive line, you're returning a lot of guys. You're getting the only starters. The starter you're losing is Audrey Peel at right tackle, which is obviously a big deal. Um, you're probably going to need to break in a new right guard because so many of the guys who have competing for that position, Jack Conley, Kevin Klein, and Dwayne Alec, are all redshirt seniors or older. But the rest of the line, you've got Jude Bowery coming back at left tackle, Logan Taylor coming back at left guard, and Drew Kendall at center. And honestly, you could probably play Logan Taylor at right tackle because I think he is good enough to play at tackle. Um, you probably, you're a little, and then you're looking at maybe like Otto Hess starting at right guard, uh, maybe Jack Funk starting at right tackle, some kind of combination there. Again, might want to look for a transfer there. Um, 
somebody who can really compete to start. But again, kind of how we're looking at this year, you're feeling pretty good about three, maybe four of the five positions. So I feel good about the offense there. And again, you kind of just assume everybody takes a bit of a progression by being in this in the same system for another year. Now, looking at the skill positions, do you think there's enough uh, like firepower there? Because like, if you're going to be a playoff team, you need to get to that next level. If you look at all the guys that could come back, is there enough firepower to get this offense, especially with Bill O'Brien coaching, to get them you know scoring enough points to win a lot of games? I think if you get Jerron Bradley and Lewis Bond back, I feel pretty good about that. If either one or God forbid both leave, then then you know we might have to kind of throw this whole conversation out the window. Um, because I like guys like Jaden Skeet and Jaden McGowan, but we kind of need to see them just play more to really know what they're gonna be. So, you know, I feel like good having those guys. You know, you've got two quality starters there, guys you can maybe if uh, maybe elevate to being all ACC players, then you've got some solid role players behind them. So I feel and I like I said, might want to find a tight end in the portal uh, who can, you know, maybe just fill out the depth there. Um, but everything else. Yeah. I would say I feel pretty decent about the skill positions going into 2025. Now let's look at the defensive side of the ball. You're going to probably lose Donovan Nazaraku. Oh yeah. Then uh, Cam Horsley is going to be gone. Cam Arnold's going to be gone. You're going to possibly lose Neto Paula. You will because they're, they're, they're seniors and they don't have any COVID eligibility. Okay. So you lose all those guys. Mm-hmm. This, is this defense going to be enough? Or are they going to have to really support it in the transfer portal and hope that they've got enough, you know, firepower to get out of the portal to 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 be to be competitive in twenty twenty five? So the position that we've talked about the most in the portal recently is edge, and so replacing as as a rock and Nepal is going to be a big thing because while I do like what Edwin Kalingi brings, and I think he can be a solid starter, uh, Gilbert Tangrangu has flashed positively, but again, I just want to see more of it. There's just not a lot of depth at this position. So, you know, we've we've been hoping that BC can find somebody in the summer. Not sure it's going to happen. But you think next year, when Bill O'Brien is, a, again, coming off what should be a decently good season and has more time and more scholarships to really attack the portal, I think he's really going to prioritize that. You just talked about how he's prioritized that in recruiting. Um, so I think they're going to find bodies there, at least one, possibly two guys that can be solid stat contributors. Interior defensive line. You're looking probably at Quan Williams and George Rooks, starting with Nate, Nigel Tate, and Sed McConnell behind them. Um, and I guess even Owen Stroudmeyer and Ty Clemens still behind them. You're probably okay there. You know, if you can find a defensive tackle that you feel good about, I'm, I'd be fine with that. But I think you can, uh, <clears throat> if you can find a, 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 a dynamic presence on the interior, that's going to be tough though, because that's a really high demand position among the best teams. So you're going to be, you know, fishing in. Uh, Highly fished waters. Not sure what a great metaphor was there. Um, but rest of the defense, you know, you're you are losing a guy like Cam Arnold, but I think, you know, assuming people get come back, you're looking at a pretty dynamic young core there. You're gonna have Davian Crouch, Bryce Steele, Sione Halla as seniors. Uh, you'll still have Jalen Blackwell and, and Owen McGowan as backups. And ideally we can see a little bit of uh Palea Feoa, uh, who was who redshirted last year. Um, maybe see what he can do. So again, it's not great but I, I you know if there isn't a dynamic linebacker i'm not super concerned about it corners i, I actually kind of like what they have you know you are going to lose brightquist brown who's going to be uh out of eligibility but you're returning amari jackson who i think is going to have a big year this year you'll still have max tucker you'll still have ryan turner uh you'll still have carter davis uh i do again maybe bring the transfer here uh probably in the slot or just somebody else so you can have some depth <laughs> if you can find a quality starter that's great safety you know, it's we're it's kind of the same thing we're looking at it from this year. Is we just don't know exactly what's going to go on there because uh, Jalen Cheek and Bug Jones are competing for the strong safety spot. I like KP Price, but we need to see more. Cole Batson looks more like a depth player. Maybe we see what Khalil Ali can do. But so again, the the, the questions facing the defense are, I would say, a lot of the same ones that they're facing this year. And we kind of think that given a whole off season to use the portal to figure out which guys are going to play well, and which ones aren't, you can start filling those holes and kind of resolve those questions that you have going into 2025. And I think that's the big question, right? Like we're going to have a whole season to play. We're going to see things that are going to happen. Guys are going to develop the guys that are going to go and become starters guys that aren't. And then you're going to see spots develop um, that are going to fill with, you know, transfers 
you know, you might see a guy that you're expecting to be a starter in 2025 that just doesn't fill it in. And then they decide, hey, maybe he's best off to go into the portal and see if he can find a new spot. So I think that's something important to watch for too. There's gonna be there's gonna be change that we're not in March or in May, excuse me, looking at now that we're gonna find out about in May. I, in, yeah, like we're gonna like we see the safety this especially the strong safety position as a major question mark right now. Like who's gonna start there? Who's gonna play well? And by the time we get to this point next year, we're going to know who played well. And, you know, let's say like Jalen Cheek is like, oh, he finally found his vision or like, oh, wow. Like, why was Bug Jones right at bench this whole time? He's a very good player. Then maybe you don't need that question or they're middling and they're like, OK, let's go out and find somebody in the portal that can come in and, you know, be a solid starter there. So, yeah, I think by the but I think that, you know, again, we're see- these are the same questions. There's not going to be any new questions that I think this defense is going to be facing this time next year. So, Mitch, I got to tell you, I posted on uh, the site yesterday that Cameron Martinez was coming. And I also had a list of all the preferred walk-ons coming on. And someone on Eagle Insider found out one of the guys was a safety from an a, uh, Ivy League and said, hey, he could be the next John Pupil. Oh, so, great. <laughs> I knew you'd have a good reaction to that one. So Fan- Fantastic. That That's really what this defense was uh, is missing going into the season. Another Ivy League safety. Yeah. yeah. So, anyways. In our final segment, let's look at the schedule for 25 because we know who they're going to play. And Mitch is going to give you the uh, he's going to give you the rationale on why the schedule is favor favorable for BC. We'll hear all about that in just a moment. This is Locked On BC. I'm your host AJ Black talking about 2025 here we're having a good discussion about why this team in a year could be in really good shape for a possible playoff bid and the last piece that we need to look at is the schedule now 2024 you look at the schedule it's tough it's a tough tough schedule with some really tough out of conference games but 2025 when you look ahead 365 days later it looks a little bit more favorable. Mitch, why does that look more positive for BC? Okay, so let's start off the first two games. The first game is at home uh, the the last Saturday in August against Fordham. FCS team should be a win. Next Saturday, home against UMass. Arguably the worst team in the FBS. Should be a win. Uh, Then between that week and September 20th, September 20th is uh, at Michigan State, which should be a decently tough game. The weekend between that is the weekend of September 11th. So that is going to be your red bandana game. So besides those first three games that are, that are on the books, here's the rest of the teams BC is going to face in 2025 home against Notre Dame. It's your final out of conference game home against Cal home against Clemson home against Georgia tech home against SMU. The away games are at Louisville at Pitt at Stanford and at Syracuse. So luckily you only have to make one long West coast trip uh, to Stanford. And then your other farthest away game is Louisville. Then you've got two, Games basically in the Northeast at Pitt and at Syracuse. So no one long road trip other than that, decently fine. <clears throat> Looking at the rest of the schedule, um, I, I, I'm I wondering if the ACC is going to put Clemson in for that red bandana game. And, you know, as we've seen over the years, if BC is going to catch one of these good teams, it's, if, it's much more likely that they do it if it's on red bandana night. So I think they're going to stick that game in there at, uh, in the middle. So you've got Fordham, UMass, home against Clemson, at Michigan State to start the season. I, Michigan State's going to be better next year. I think BC yep. is also going to be better. Um, so I think basically that game is a toss-up. Um, and yep. again, luckily, it's not an AC game. So if you lose it, it's not that big a deal. Um, and I kind of try to project out the rest of the schedule based on kind of just ACC patterns. And I've tried to look at all the other team schedules to see if this works. So what I would imagine is after the Michigan State game, you'll get a home game probably against Georgia Tech, if I had to guess. Then a bye week, first week of October, because BC's bye week is always the first or second week of October. After the bye week, I would think they go at Stanford, you know, a long road trip. Ideally, the ACC gives BC time so they don't have to come go there um, on a short week or, you know, on a regular week. It might even be a Friday game because then it kind of, it's a weekday game, but you're still off a bye week, so it's fine. Then I think you get home against SMU, then at Louisville to uh, basically end October. Then their second bye, because now there's two bye weeks. Then to end the season November versus Cal, at Pitt versus Notre Dame, and at Syracuse. And looking at the schedule of opponents, 
I'm not, you know, Georgia Tech is hard to figure out. You know, I think they're, they're in 2025, they're probably losing Haynes King, so they're going to need to find a new quarterback. That defense has never been good, and I don't think it's going to be any good, any better this this year or next year. Um, so that look, and that's at home, so I think that's that's good for BC. So I'm feeling good about that one. At Stanford, long road trip, but and you know maybe they get more active in the portal, but that's really hard at Stanford, and I just I just think they're still not going to be good in two years. Um, you know they've got I know they've got one really good wide receiver, but that's about it. Uh, versus SMU, um, looking at that team, you know I think they'll be they'll be more prepared for ACC play in 2025 than this year. Um, luckily, BC gets them at home, so you know you assume BC gets a little better. Maybe that game's a toss up, or you feel decent about it. Uh, at Louisville, hard hard to know what Louisville's going to look like in two years because every year they seem to turn over the roster completely with how yep. the portal goes. So you know maybe you chalk the one up as a loss because Jeff Brom is a good coach and BC really struggles to play well at louisville okay so after this so going to november then you've got versus cal i don't think cal's very good i don't think they'll be very good in two years they might have a new head coach so you, you feel good about that matchup at pitt i, I just finished right i'm going to start the opponent preview series on the site and i'm doing it backwards in terms of the order of this year's schedule so pitt is bc's final opponent in 2024 so that way when we get to august i'll have to write the fsu preview once um so Pitt is not very good. <laughs> and I think they're going to be worse <laughs> next year because that defense has lost a ton of talent this off season at every level. Um, they're going to lose even more experienced players next year. Um, and that offense still, I, I just don't know. I don't feel, I don't feel like I can trust it yet. So, I mean, that, honestly, that could be a, that, that game could be coaching against somebody who's not named Pat Narduzzi, which would be kind of weird, weird. All right. Uh, last second, to last game of the season versus Notre Dame. I'm not going to say they're going to beat Notre Dame because Notre Dame's really good always. Just just a big talent gap between BC and them. But, you know, yeah, you get them late November. You know, that's last home game, senior day. You know, maybe you can pull something crazy off. So I, I would say lean loss, but, you know, who knows. And then the final week of the final game of the season at Syracuse, I think by that time the shine will really have worn off Fran Brown because he's never been a head coach before. And, you know, he's getting a lot of recruiting wins now and portal wins and what have you. But, you know, once we get to the inevitable point of the season where Syracuse is one of their non-conference games and everything's great, and then they start falling off the end of the season, we'll see what the real Fran Brown is. So in terms of the schedule, I think you've got maybe four games that are, you know, toss-ups. You've got, or at least losses. Clemson, Michigan wait, wait, State. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Pause for a second. You're not buying on an offensive coordinator that has a deep roots with the New York Giants? <laughs> no, not Sorry. No, um, okay. No. Sorry. <laughs> all right, so Clemson. Michigan State, uh, I'll say Louisville, and Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. Now, again, I'm I'm expecting pretty much both units to take a pretty big step forward in 2025, where you get help from the portal, you get more experience, you get development in the system. Uh, again, like you talked about, more strength conditioning, so this team is ready to go. If you can pull off upsets in two of those games, and especially like if you can, you know, beat Clemson and beat Notre Dame, grant both of them at home. That could be pretty impressive to the committee. And then your losses, maybe, maybe let's, you know, let's switch it up. Let's just get, um, we'll say it's a loss to Notre Dame because then, and lost to Michigan State. So then you, you clear your ACC schedule. Maybe you make the ACC championship. Even if you don't, and you're like the third team and some other team that's 11 and one faces another 11, one or 12 and 0 team. One of those teams is going to be 11 and two. And if they get blown out, you're looking at a spot in the playoff. It's probably not hosting one, but Hey, Maybe you can sneak in with, but my point is I think BC can get in with a 10 and two record. And if their losses are to a good, a decent Clemson team and a decent Notre Dame team. That's and, I, I, and I look at Thomas Castellanos as a huge X factor. Yeah. Like if he can develop, if Bill O'Brien can get him into a serviceable passing quarterback, uh, like we saw and, at the beginning, at the beginning let's say con consistently serviceable because there were times when he flashed incredibly. And obviously times where he was, abysmal if he can just get raise the raise the floor and even if the ceiling drops a little bit just so we can know what we're getting every week and not have those crazy interceptions where he just throws it right to a defender that's really all we need you know if, if you're trying to throw a ball deep downfield or fit it in a tight window in a clutch situation i can forgive throwing an interception there but when it's early in the game and you're you know throwing into a, a throwing a bad pass and in, into a contested window for no reason we can't have that it, it, yeah if he eliminates all of that He's got the dynamic 
uh, playability that just wins in college football. Like he's the kind of guy that just wins games. He's just gonna cut out the stupid penalty, uh, stupid uh, turnovers. So yeah, and like, fr- frankly, at the end of the day, like a-, a lot of this does hinge on him and his yep. development, and that that goes for Bill O'Brien as well. But it's like how much can we really ring out of him? Because if, you know, he kind of stays where he is, maybe gets a little better, you know, he's a, he's a solid AC quarterback, you know, has some, has some good games against bad teams, but you know, doesn't, can't really elevate his game. Then this is obviously a moot point, but if Bill O'Brien can really help him maximize his talent and reach his ceiling, then, you know, that's what that, that's kind of what this is all operating on because for a team like BC, you know, it's kind of an interesting dichotomy. The playoff is you either have this, just like a Georgia, like a crazy good roster where it's just, you're, you don't really need that elite quarterback play where, you know, the guy like Stetson Bennett who can be a game manager and basically just get you and get you to the end. Um, and obviously there's teams that, and then there are teams that just have this crazy good quarterback that, you know, elevates their kind of play. And obviously you have teams that have both like 2019 LSU um, and stuff like that. But, you know, so BC is not going to be one of those teams where they just have you know, draft picks galore. And they're not going to be Michigan or Georgia, where they have, you know, 14, 15 guys getting picked in a draft. You right. need that elite quarterback that's going to elevate your team to the next level. And I think Thomas Castellanos has the talent to do that. And I also think he has like the mentality of, I'm going to put this team on my back. And, you know, no matter, you know, I hate to bring this comparison up, but do the Tim Tebow thing. Right. Yeah. He's a win. He's got the um, moxie and the, like the just, will to win games he's just got to cut down on the things that cost them and so mm-hmm. that's going to be a huge factor if this year and next year because i mean honestly you look at the tough schedule bc has this year if thomas castellanos is playing at an elite level he's going to keep them in every game this year and you know and even and i would even take like a good more consistent level where you know they're like some games just like hey man you're trying your hardest but the other team's just better and you know you know, sometimes things just don't work out your way. But if, but if this year can be the crucible that forges this team, and I think this this year can be the crucible that forges this team into a possible playoff contender in 2025. That's kind of my philosophy. It's honestly kind of how the 2022 year was the crucible for the offensive line. Obviously, got help from outside. Chris Mahogany coming back, Kyle Hurdle joining, and Logan Taylor joining. But then you got guys behind them who, when they get pressed into spot duty, they're competent. And I think that if you kind of expand that idea to BC as a team in 2024 we're going to see them take another step forward in 2025 all right Mitch we've been talking for a while now let's wrap things up where can people find your work you can find me at Mitchell T Wolf W-O-L-F-E on Twitter uh like I said or like AJ said sorry uh have this big offensive line preview coming out by the time you're listening to this um I think it's about 6,000 words on the offensive line Uh, I've got um you know scheme breakdowns uh stuff like that uh pass blocking, run blocking, and then kind of just an overview of the roster slash depth chart of what we're going to see this year. So it's pretty comprehensive. Uh, please go check it out. I think it's pretty cool stuff. Uh, and then, like I said, we'll get the opponent preview started in the coming weeks. So then you get to know uh, the teams that he's going to be facing this year. And if you got Mitch with all the previews for uh, the upcoming season, you got me. I have everything you want recruiting wise i'm telling you i've been talking to the staff i'm talking to the players i got everything up there come over to eagle insider check all that out on monday we're gonna have the fallout from this weekend it's the first official visit weekend there's 13 players on campus i'm expecting multiple commitments by the time we record again for monday's episode you want to hear my thoughts on all of that you can follow me on Twitter at AJBlack247. Make sure you hit that subscribe and like this episode on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts and tell your friends about Locked On Boston College. We'll be back again on Monday for your team every day.